Uh, what I want to talk about is written here is, so to speak, at best a footnote to the previous talk. So why linearity? This actually catches up with the quest question which Baylock just asked, because uh, linearity through the superposition principle gives us interference and actually also entanglement. So I think linearity is actually more basic in some sense than entanglement, because if you have entangled states, you can always choose a big enough Hilbert space and disentangle them at the cost of changing the algebra of observables. So that is mathematically well known. I think linearity in some sense is even more intriguing. Okay, let me say more precisely what I mean by uh, linearity. Linearity I define as that dynamics map states linearly on states, and there has been in the history a um, theorem, of course, that quantum mechanics is linear, uh, provided by Wigner and Bachmann, and the assumption there is that the dynamics does not change. Oops, now we have to practice here. Oh, my darling, which one is which now? Echo, that the dynamics does not change the overlap of states, and of course we know that the unitary evolution is an example which does that. But if the Hamiltonian is depending on the state, then of course immediately you leave this scenario and things become nonlinear, and you know that there have been attempts to go in this direction, but this is not my topic here. More recently, from within quantum mechanics, you can actually prove under much wider, say, assumption that quantum mechanics has to be linear, and I've uh, summarized it here as saying no influences without interactions. And this includes, for example, also the idea that any hidden variable series should not lead to superluminal signaling. This is actually even more general. And uh, experiments which test for the linearity of quantum mechanics, they basically test, Jordan explains this very well in some recent papers, uh, they test actually these kind of assumptions. So, what I want to do is I want to replace this assumption by something else, this no influences without interactions. And what I have to say is based on three uh, very different strands of thought, which are quite old. For example, this, uh, deterministic discrete mechanics has been brought up by Lee and Friedberg mostly uh, about 25 years ago. Sampling theory has been advocated recently by Kempf in the last 10 years very much. Uh, all for very different purposes. These ideas have been brought up for very different purposes. And it was mentioned already in the previous discussion, quantum mechanics can be actually formulated completely in terms of classical notions of observables and phase space. This is a beautiful paper, according to me, one of the most beautiful papers, but not known by Heslo about um, uh, 30 years ago in FISFD. Beautiful. And it tells you, for example, also that the problems of Born rule, measurement, you can all phrase it in classical terms, but of course there are differences to quantum mechanics. But the language can be made completely classical. And recently, uh, Boric and collaborators and I myself have used this language because it's very handy uh, in order to describe quantum classical hybrid systems, which again is a different topic than we have addressing here. Now, what I get from these three ideas, and which is the program of today, is a certain class of cellular automata, which for obvious reason you will see, I will call Hamiltonian cellular automata, and I will give you an action principle for this, which is, so to speak, the central part of my uh, talk. Uh, then I will use sampling theory uh, to construct a map from the cellular automata on continuum quantum mechanics plus some corrections because we have this discreteness in the system from the start. And I will use this language of Heslow, which will be implicit. I will not <laughs> say much about it. But the bottom line should come out, and I say it here in case I run out of time. From the cellular automaton perspective, actually you have not much choice if you are in this uh, class of cellular automata. Of course, you can invent any kind of cellular automaton you like, and things go completely berserk. But I confine myself to a very specific class of cellular automata. And from that perspective, the linearity of quantum mechanics superposition principle in the spin-off and so on is practically unavoidable. OK, so how do we do this? The assumptions, this comes now, now I'll talk for a while about this discrete mechanics. The assumptions are that there is a fundamental discreteness to be incorporated in the dynamics. This has been explicited 
or is explicitly said by T.D. Lee in this way, uh, that, that means we have a fundamental length or time scale, and if you want to try to uh, phrase it a little bit more metaphysically, it means there is a certain cutoff on the number of events that can take place in a given space-time volume or on the number of measurements which you can do that. And by the way, for those who know, uh, this is actually the starting point how in a, um, in a model of which attempts to go towards quantum gravity by Sorkin and collaborators in this so-called causal set, it's exactly this way how they put a scale in their theory because otherwise the theory of causal sets is uh, scale-free and you don't know what physically it means. And finally, for the developing the scheme, what is important is that time is a discrete dynamical variable for me. Okay. Now, what we do, what is the cellular automaton? I talk about cellular automata with a denumerable finite or denumerable number of degrees of freedom, which are described, you can think of some nodes which sit in an abstract space, and these nodes carry uh, coordinates and momenta and explicitly, I separate here the uh, spatial coordinate, so to speak, from the time coordinate. This makes it a non-relativistic approach. Eventually, we will see that this leads to a certain problem, and eventually one has to make these things relativistic. Here, this alpha denotes different degrees of freedom. It's a natural number, and n denotes successive states of this automaton, how it evolves. This replaces, so to speak, our notion of time. There is an intrinsic clock in this thing. That's actually why I call it bit, bit machines. I talk about integer numbers. Everything in this chapter is about integer numbers. There are no real numbers anywhere. Uh, so one can also code it into bits. So these are really bit machines. And now I introduce uh, some abbreviations which are useful for the following. We have these finite differences of, for any of such variables. We need these quantities here, and why we see here. Now, this is perhaps the most important slide. Uh, we come to the action principle, and in these abbreviations which are introduced, there are certain quantities in red, which are all parameters of the model. We have here a symmetric matrix, an anti-symmetric matrix, a constant, and we have a remainder term, which is important, which is supposed to take care of polynomial terms which are of higher order than these quadratic terms, okay? So everything's integer parameters and integer variables here. The action now uh, comes out of the blue is this, but when you look at it uh, from a certain distance, it reminds you of a standard action, I hope, in Hamiltonian formulation. It's not so unusual, just that everything is discrete and integer. And I say that the updating rules, how this machine progresses, are given by this variational principle. Of course, I have to say what the variations are. The variations are defined like this, where f is any of these variables which play a role here. And uh, what is important, in distinction to anything, I think, which we usually learn in mechanics, field theory, or whatever, the uh, action principle is based on integer variations because our variables are integer, so I have no choice, I cannot do uh, infinitesimal variations. Usually we always think we do something, then we vary infinitesimally, and in some sense this is unique. But here we have to leave this because infinitesimal variations, they would lead us to things which are not defined for this automaton. We cannot have an uh, integer coordinate and an epsilon aside of it. It doesn't exist in this setting. So we have to uh, use integer variations, but if we do integer variations, any integer variation is as good as any other. So this is a big difference from usual mechanics of field theory, that we have no criterion how to choose the variations. The variations can vary all over the place, and that makes a big difference, as we see now. Namely, what happens is, I said I introduced above here this remainder term, which is supposed to take care of higher polynomial terms, but if you do this and now you do your integer arbitrary integer variations, what happens? You create from these higher order terms, you create actually additional equations of motion and you run into a problem because suddenly you have more equations of motion than variables. So you, what, what is the way out? You have to drop this term. There is no way out, otherwise you cannot make it consistent. So this is very 
delicate point because everything else follows essentially from that that we have a quadratic action with parameters which are, we are free to choose, but it is a quadratic action and it cannot be anything else, otherwise the whole setup doesn't work. It's not consistent. And um, there's one side remark here actually. You could choose a small number of such additional terms. What would they do? They would allow you to encode the initial conditions for the cellular automaton. So if you want to have everything in one uh, action principle, you can even include the initial conditions by including a small number of them. But you cannot have arbitrarily this thing for all this variable, for all values of this variable n which is our computer clock time, because you create too many equations of motion. Okay, so now we use this and see what happens. Of course, what we will do, we will derive the equations of motion, uh, which I did here. These are now finite difference equations because everything is finite. We have no continuous derivatives, etc. Here I introduce in purpose uh, this type of object which replaces the usual time derivatives. That's why I wrote these equations. And you see immediately they have a Hamiltonian structure, these equations. And we see now also that this uh, time variable, which we were separated from the other variables, comes into this equation like what one says in relativity, like a lapse function. It tells you, so to speak, how the physical time, how fast the physical time runs with respect to the computer clock time, so to speak. I will come back to that later because we will see we are actually very constrained in what we can choose here. That's why I choose here this uh, parameter C already from the start because if I choose something more general, immediately this does not work. But we I will be actually even more constrained in this respect. Here I just used it to derive the whole scheme. Now, first observation is that these equations are time reversal invariant. You can read them uh, say from, if you know state n minus one and state n, you can calculate from this equation state n plus one, but you can as well read these equations backwards, so this is the time reversal invariant. And now comes a little surprise, of course, with hindsight, it is not a surprise, I mean, somehow you had to construct this whole thing and I started at another edge, but here I presented, so to speak, that it comes as a little surprise. Namely, let's introduce now a self-adjoint matrix, which is just this combination of this symmetric matrix, which defined our action, and this anti-symmetric matrix. And let's combine these coordinates and momenta in this very obvious way, which of language I will use now is the language of quantum mechanics, but this is not quantum mechanics, of course. It's just discrete quantities, but the formal, out, I mean, the way this thing looks already reminds you of something. Now, how, what can we do with this? Let's see. <clears throat> First thing, we can, because the equation is linear, so this is very nice, it's of course, essential, uh, essential aspect, we can immediately find the conservation laws for this automaton, namely for any matrix which commutes with what we call now the Hamiltonian, uh, which commutes with the Hamiltonian, there is such a discrete, corresponding discrete conservation law. In particular, if this matrix is self-adjoint with complex integer elements, because everything is inter uh, integer valued, the psi, this is a complex integer, but uh, this matrix is integer valued, etc. So if we choose, for example, g equal to the identity, we get constraint, which reminds us of something which later will become the wave function normalization. And if we choose g as h itself, we get something which is obviously replacing energy conservation. Now there's a, another interesting aspect here. Namely, we cannot trivially integrate these equations. We cannot, like in the continuum, we would just pull out this dot from the equation, put it in front, and we have the conserved quantity. This does not work for these uh, discrete equations because the Leibniz rule of, is modified uh, because everything is discrete. You have no product rule. So here's shown an example of that. So we cannot simply integrate them, but we have the conservation laws at least. So this is nice. <clears throat> now we want to get more closer to quantum mechanics. So obvious thing to do is we want to get away slowly from the discreteness because we want to recover what we know. Uh, we introduce the scale I was talking about before. 
And the idea would be, of course, that n times l, where l is this discreteness scale, defines something like a discrete physical time now, which has the right dimensions, let's say. But we immediately have a problem because the continuum limit that l goes to zero cannot be taken not too naively. It does not work because the integer valuedness of our variables, if you have a var variable and now you want to take a derivative, immediately things diverge. So we have to do something else. And here, of course, this is inspired very much by Professor Toft. The only way out is to, uh, uh, to construct a map between these discrete integer valued variables and continuous differentiable ones. But now, this is again something which has been around for at least 50 years. Actually, the mathematical uh, properties which go into that, they go even back 100 years. Some people say even go back to Cauchy, um, doesn't matter. But who has uh, put it up in this context was Shannon again 50 years ago. Namely, he said explicitly, information can be simultaneously continuous and discrete. And we all know this whenever you have to convert digital information into analog form, uh, information or the other way around, you have to do something like constructing such a map. So how can this work? <clears throat> There's a theorem which is called the sampling theorem. Namely, consider functions, the Fourier transformation of which is defined only over a certain band of frequencies, like here, where the bandwidth is the limit of this integral. Then there is this theorem of Shannon, which you can immediately prove. I mean, it's like one page at most uh, using properties of Fourier transformation. Given this function f uh, at a finite number, uh, not at a finite, I'm sorry, at the equidistantly spaced times, we, we sample now our function at these points Tn, uh, which are equidistantly spaced with a certain spacing. Then there is a reconstruction formula, namely it's equivalent to know these discrete samples of the function or to know the function over the real line of t. So this is exactly what we need to go to get to something continuous starting with our cellular automaton. It doesn't mean we take a continuum limit, we just represent things in a different way. And what this does for us is that it relates this automaton clock time, what, what is ticking here in this machine here, uh, it relates it to this discrete physical time by introducing a scale and it maps it through this construction on the continuous time. This function here is actually has been known. This is maybe where Cauchy comes in as the sinus cardinalis, is this function sinus of x over x, and it plays a crucial role here. Okay, and the bandwidth is then given by one over our discreteness scale. This actually, in the context of the information theory, is often referred to as a Nyquist rate, which tells that this was actually already known 100 years ago. So these things are coming from different um, places here. Okay, so what we do with this now is obvious. We apply this reconstruction formula to our discrete Schrödinger equation. It's not the Schrödinger equation, but really resembles it very much. The important point always being that this equation is linear. And now we see that we are in trouble with our uh, lapse function or with separating the physical time tau from the other coordinates and momenta. Because you see, if you have here such a product of two bandwidth limited functions, it's not a fun bandwidth limited function with the same bandwidth. So we just cannot do it this way. And that is why I choose now this tau, the, how the quick the physical time runs as a constant. And I think this is really telling us that the non-relativistic approach, which I'm taking here, is very limited. But it doesn't say we can do it we cannot do it more generally, but one has to start somewhere. So now what happens to this equation if I imply, apply uh, this reconstruction formula? It assumes this form, where we see now these are now continuous wave functions over continuous time, and uh, we see what happens is that the leading term is just the Schrödinger equation which we have, but they are correction terms, and these correction terms are unimportant, let's say, uh, if the wave function does not vary too rapidly with respect to this underlying discreteness scale. That was to be expected and is def defined through this bandwidth limit. Then you can ask for stationary states of this equation. You get a dispersion relation like this, where for the moment I assume, because this was a self-adjoint matrix, that it is diagonalized, and you get an equation like this. And there are two interesting aspects here. One is that at high energies, 
there is a cutoff which we expected from the bandwidth limit, so you cannot go to arbitrary, arbitrary high energy stationary states. There's a modification of the spectrum. And the second question, actually, which I, where I don't know the answer yet, is when you have a given Hamiltonian function here, or let's say the matrix composed of integer, so complex integer quantities, do they have interesting spectra? This, I think, I don't know the answer. It's a mathematically well-defined question, but I don't know the answer. If it's a two-by-two two matrix, you can sit down and an answer it for yourself immediately. That works. But if it's a very large matrix of integers, uh, can one say something about the spectrum? I don't know. I just had, didn't have time to look for literature. To, but I will. this is a very pressing question, I think, what will happen there. OK. So now, the conservation loss, which we had for the automaton now, of course, also get mapped to something else. This is almost obvious, because if we look how the equa uh, this discrete Schrodinger equation got to the continuous Schrodinger equation, it was basically by replacing this discrete uh, time derivative by this combination of continuous time de derivatives. So you can just replace this in the conservation laws which we had before, and you get this, and you can check this, that this is actually correct. So we have the con uh, continuous version of this conservation laws, and in particular, if we choose this matrix as the identity, we get really something which replaces the wave function normalization condition. Um, which is the usual one if these correction terms which come from when you expand the sinus function are not too, uh, not too big. Then you can discard them and things work fine. What I think is very interesting in this whole thing, and I still don't understand fully the consequences, is that the same commutator, say any G which commutes with H, gives you the discrete conservation laws as well as the quantum mechanical ones. Now, what is, why is this interesting or why is there a problem or a question? Because in the quantum mechanical case, we know that the such discrete matrices or operators, uh, sorry, not discrete, that su such self-adjoint uh, operators, they generate also the symmetries just by generating unitaries, for example. In the discrete case, there is no such thing like this a priori, and that is also another mathematical point which I think one has to understand. What does work very well here now? We can take the continuum limit, as I indicated already, and everything works because we have replaced our discrete language by the continuous language. And now I'm getting actually to my end. So some things to find out in this whole approach is what are, I just said it, what are the cellular automaton properties that become the unitary symmetries? I mean, there should be something, at least that's what we feel. Do these Hamiltonians have interesting spectra when they are large? That I don't know at all. If somebody has a suggestion where to look for literature, it would be nice. Um, a practical, practical spin-off of this, one could think of new quantum mechanical approximation schemes based on bandwidth limited functions because they introduce a regularization of whatever you do. And the nice thing is that the conservation laws are from the beginning built in, which is usually a problem if you look at some field equations discretized, uh, it's always people have to work very hard to keep the conservation laws under control. For example, there was, I think in the 70s or something, came out a paper which at that time made a big noise. There was a discretization of the Navier-Stokes equation on some very funny, um, I think, hexagonal lattice or so, which conserved the, con uh, which preserved the conservation laws, and that made a big noise. But after all, we see here that this is something very generic if you start at the right angle, if you do it at the right angle. OK, then of course the question, as I said, that is problematic to separate time from the other variables. I did it because it helped me to set up the scheme. So we have to ask what is the relativistic or the field theory version of this map, which I presented here. And finally, a very interesting question, I think, is uh, how do gauge fields come in? Because uh, at the moment, I don't see how the gauge fields should be formulated in the discrete formulation in my cellular automaton. But certainly, in the continuum formulation, we can immediately replace, for example, in our uh, discrete Schrodinger equation, where is it? We can uh, replace derivatives which appear there 
by the covariant derivative, so we know how to do that. But what does it mean if we go back to the cellular automaton by doing sampling of this equation or sampling of such a wave function? That I don't understand either at the moment, but I think it's very interesting. And now I come to my conclusion, so I made it in time. Um, so what we have seen is that for, for this class of Hamiltonian cellular automata, integer quant uh, systems which are described by completely integer valued uh, quantities and parameters, everything integer valued, and we, we can set up this action principle and the important point was that we have actually no choice if we want to stay within this class of automata. Uh, we have no choice. We have to admit for this action principle arbitrary variations, which is a big difference, as I said, as far as I know, uh, from everything else we learned before. And uh, this leads us to some equations which remind of quantum mechanics, but which are not quantum mechanics. Uh, but then we, on top of it, we use the sampling theory to do, construct the map from the discrete to the continuum, and then we really are quantum mechanical with correction terms. And as I mentioned in the beginning when I started, the important point in all of this when dealing with the equations, when looking at the properties, conservation laws, the basic property which plays a role here is the linearity of the equations. That, I think that is the essential point. Without it, there may be some particular uh, system. We know that, for example, there are lattice systems where people study solitonic solutions, freezers, and so on and so forth. But they're always very particular and special. As a whole class of problems, linearity is the only way to go, I think. We got the Schrodinger equation with correction terms, which incorporates this discreteness scale. And as I stressed, I think the important thing is that the conservation laws also map one-to-one -one between both languages. And this is the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, there's time for questions and remarks. Yes, please. Uh, with microphone. It's difficult just, to hear. Just a second. Can you speculate a bit on how you want to recover Lorentz invariants? Um, do you think this might work similar to the causal sets approach or Achim Kempf's approach because you the mentioned acoustic, both? I, I, I cannot you still can hear anything. <laughs> no, it's all blurred in my ears at least. <laughs> you know, I just come to <laughs> <What>? the front. <laughs> Can you speculate a bit on how you want to recover Lorentz invariance? You think this might work similar to the causal sets approach or the approach by Achim Kempf, because you mentioned both? Um, well, here, uh, to introduce relativity, I think what one has to do, one has to start with a relativistic uh, field equation, I mean, like, like Klein-Gordon type of equation, and start to think how can this approach imp be implemented. And actually, technically, how I would do this is actually, I would look at my cellular automaton, define some thing which reminds of field theory, and then try to do the step towards the quantum theory using pass integral language. Because we, I, I actually worked it out myself, there is a pass integral formulation for a classical equations of motion. I mean, it's maybe not a surprise, but it works nicely. And you can use this, of course, then all the integrations become summations, and then you can look what does this for field theory, because then on the, on the quantum side, we know what the pass integral for field theory, I mean, there's all the technology to, to look at that. Um, I mean, one thing, of course, like, like in Professor Hof, Toft's talk, one has to have also a lattice, a discreteness in the spatial direction, so to speak, and these two things have to be compatible with each other. That, otherwise, I, I don't know in which sense you want me to speculate. The causal set approach is... Uh, The omega? The omega no, the omega. The omega is this uh, is the representative of the discreteness scale in the continuous language. So there is a cutoff. There is a regularization, which actually I think is very welcome. I would say. And um, but why you worry about this? I mean, in the in the causal set approach, one starts from discrete quantities completely from the start, and uh, Lorentz invariance or covariance is implemented by doing a certain distribution of how you generate your causal sets. And um, yeah, I don't, 
what do you want to hear from me? <laughs> I don't know. One more remark, question, please. Uh, there was, uh, when I passed through this, I found a bit difficulty in getting a conserved quantity that is bounded. It is, seems to be very difficult to me to get a conserved quantity that is bounded from below. Because uh, the Hamiltonian normally is, is of course, positive and mm -hmm. serves to stabilize the solutions. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I try to do this, I find that the only cases where you can stabilize in this way are, in fact, the models that I described, yeah, the one plus one dimensional theories. With in addition, you can have periodic boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. But those were the most gen general models I could find of this sort, which have something that stabilizes them. Mm -hmm. So that you have a vacuum state and you have excited states on top of that. Mm -hmm. Do you have more general things? Do you have other examples of models of this sort which have a natural ground state and excited states? Yeah, I think I think here when you when you I think here this is somehow implemented when you define the cellular automaton because you already defined the structure of the, of the action, let's say, or of this Hamiltonian, that you use this um, self-adjoint matrices at that point. Yes, but they have to and be positive. Or, or that we yeah, have the sum of squares should never be in the minus, minus square there. And I found it very difficult to make models of the sort where yeah. not somewhere there's a minus sign in your mm -hmm. Hamiltonian mm -hmm. so that the floor f drops out of your theory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but you see, when maybe we should oh, no. <laughs> when when I go back to uh, to where I started with this cellular automaton, I didn't have to say what the Hamiltonian actually is. That that I think is nice thing of this scheme. I can just put any any parameterization of this Hamiltonian H alpha beta into it, and of course I can choose one which is already bounded. I mean, so I can put the and physics. That seems to be very by, difficult. Yeah, but to I, make that, anyone that is bounded in all the, in one particular direction. Yeah, but at that stage, I can do it by hand, so to speak. I can put, just choose, for example, I, I don't know, I can choose an oscillator, I can choose a quartic oscillator, calculate the Hamiltonian matrix, and put it into this formulation. Of course, this is by hand, but uh, I think the way I understand your question is, at the level of the discreteness, do we have something which tells us what are the forces which eventually would give us the Hamiltonian? And I think that, that no, no, does no. not answer Just this. find any Hamiltonian, any Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. Any, or, or more generally, any quantity that stabilizes your thing. Mm -hmm. So some conserved quantity which has a, a floor to it so that you can have a limited number of excited states mm -hmm. and they can only go into each other because, because the energy is limited. Mm -hmm. And that's what stabilizes our world in, in, in the real world where we have particles which are bounded by an energy constraint. Mm -hmm. Let me just go back here. Uh, here. You see, the, what I get, I, I don't have to say at this level here what this H alpha beta is, except that it's a self-adjoint <coughs> matrix. And if it's self-adjoint, I can, for the argument, I can assume that it's diagonalized, and I can choose what is my lowest, lowest eigenvalue of this matrix. Here I put it really in by hand. I don't have to specify what is the physical model, so to speak. I mean, this is a big freedom here. At the same time, it's a lack because I don't have a theory of the forces which should govern this, uh, this uh, cellular automaton. But I can choose any decent Hamiltonian at this level, composed of integer numbers, and then I have this dispersion relation which tells me that the lowest level, which is a small energy, is more or less the lowest eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, and at the higher energies, somehow the spectrum is cut off. But I have here this enormous freedom of choosing anything I want, and in particular well, something bound. I would like to see any example. Any, well, for, any for, non-trivial example. The only examples I found were the trivial ones. Yeah. I mean, what, the only thing I checked uh, for solutions of this equation, I think that is crucial, is uh, when this matrix is two by two, because then you can do a back of the envelope and everything is fine. But uh, if it's a larger matrix, I, I don't know the mathematics. Well, if I have a large matrix composed of only integer entries, what, what are the properties of the spectrum? Is there anything known whether it necessarily... As soon as you choose that non-trivial, you get minus signs.